All right, awesome. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, for those of you guys who were in the room a little bit earlier, uh, I tried starting at 9.15. Sorry about that. I got my times a little bit mixed up. Um, here on the East Coast, it's morning. Um, so for those guys joining around the world, it might be afternoon or for some of you guys, early, early morning or, or starting to become afternoon, late evening. Um, but welcome, thank you. Um, Judy had a quick welcome slide that um, if she wants to go through, I'll give her a chance to kind of quickly work through. Today, what we're going, no, you good? Okay. So today, what we're going to work through is kind of the first bulk session, if you joined us last week, kind of going through our program here for the next 12 weeks. So the first three weeks that we're going to be together, we're going to kind of be talking about a communication portion. So for those of you guys that remember, um, one of the things that we had talked about is following the C3PO framework. Right, but of the three P's specifically with this idea of payload propulsion and um, and uh, what's the last what's the last P? G? Power. 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 Right. Um, we're specifically going to be focusing on payload as power and propulsion will be provided by the rocket. So really, what we care about is kind of understanding and breaking down these satellites that you guys have in your current possession with the STEM starter kit as to exactly what's going on. So this week, right, talking about communication, what we'll be looking at in particular is this idea of how it is that this data that is being collected is actually being communicated so that we can get an understanding of it. So if all of you guys went ahead and plugged your STEM starter kits in, one of the things that you'll see is that this OLED display lights up, right? And it gives you all of this information if you have everything together, right? And if you actually go through the process of connecting it, onto the, uh, the Kibana data dashboard, right? Then one of the things that you also see is that it seems to somehow be able to magically transport all of this information, right? From this piece of hardware all the way to your computer, right? So what we wanna talk about is kind of how that happens, right? And what is it that we can do to either manipulate or change and understand why it is those things happen so that we can then use them to our advantage as well. All right, so today is kind of the beginning part of that where we're going to be looking at this idea of understanding how those signals originate, right, and then what they turn into. All right, so for the teachers joining us, one of the things that we're going to kind of be going through is looking at it from a, a student perspective majority, right, and then hopefully you guys will be able to think about how you might be able to utilize it in the context of your own classroom as well. For those of you that did not actually get it yet, if you take a look in the chat, there is a Google Drive folder that's been supplied. This Google Drive folder has all the, uh, all the things that we're using in today's activities. Um, so by being a participant today, right, you guys have access to those things. For teachers, if you guys are in need of the instructor notes to kind of understand the overarching um, vision of these next three weeks, email Judy directly, or if you request it through the Discord, then Judy will be able to reach out to you directly and get you that information, all right? So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm gonna share my screen. So everyone right now, I see a couple of us have started popping into the Google Doc, all right? What I'm going to start with is this idea of what the actual slides show, all right? So hopefully all of you guys have gone through and as I said, it plugged in your STEM starter kit. So the first question that kind of comes to mind is, how is it that it's actually collecting all of these things? And then how is it that it's showing that data? Right, so you see that there's a screen for the temperature as well as the humidity, or there's also this screen that tells you how much light is coming in. Right, so of those things, how is it that all of that kind of gets actually populated and displayed? I think we all have this kind of baseline understanding of what's happening as a whole, right? You know, some kind of input comes in, right? The sensor is on, is connected, and then it can take that data and then turn it into a number. But today's activity is really gonna focus on how it's actually turning these things into a number in particular. So the very first thing that I want you guys to do, specifically for the students that are joining us, if you go ahead and take a look at the, at the bottom, right? I want you guys to create a visual roadmap, all right? And I know this is gonna sound a little bit weird, but I want you to create a roadmap that kind of explains how something is coming to the sensor, such as the light sensor or the weather sensor, and then how it is being displayed on the LED screen, right? So that OLED screen that you have that actually pops up with the numerical values, I want you to take a look at that in particular and think about how it's giving you a number, 
right? So for example, one of the things that we'll be using today is our light sensor explicitly, right? Last time I checked, if I look up, right, for the lights that are in my room, they're not numbers, right? And yet on the OLED screen, right, it gives you a number that describes how much light there is. So there must be something happening that changes then the actual amount of light that our eyes are seeing to then tell you a number that describes how much light there is. All right, so I'll give students a little bit of time who are joining us today, right, to actually go through this process and get some of their ideas in. And you guys should be able to actually input some of your thoughts into the slideshow as well. So during our session today, I'm gonna to go ahead and change this from anyone can view to also anyone can edit, all right? So if you guys want to, for the students joining us, go ahead and input your roadmaps, your visualizations into the slides attached, all right? You can go ahead and feel free to do so, all right? So I'm gonna give students about five minutes to work through that. And while students are working through that who have joined us, for the teachers that I have, um, real quick, this is an opportunity for students to be able to kind of show you where they are in their understanding, right? So this is me kind of going back and forth between the, the student side and the teacher side. So as teachers, right, in your own classrooms, one of the things, one of the activities that you can do is if you have students whiteboard, right, how they are kind of coming to their conclusions about, okay, what is the actual information that is being collected and then how is it being shown, right? You can get an idea if students are thinking about this idea of analog then to digital already, right? If not, then you have an idea of where it is that you need to begin. So it can help structure the context of this particular lab. So I wanna be clear that the lab currently is scaffolded for a high school level student. So someone who is in, in secondary school, but it can always be scaffolded down and broken up into smaller assignments, right? That you can do across, you know, a week or two weeks, right? And it is NGSS uh, specific. Um, it addresses those science and engineering practices, um, particularly talking about how data is transferred, right? So one of the things in the physical sciences um, that it talks about is how is it that these signals that are not in binary are then translated into binary and then communicated or stored. Right, so if you need those standard specific things, again, if you reach out to Judy, then the instructor notes has all of that information as well, all right? So for our students, right, if you're joining us, uh, hopefully you guys are working through those roadmaps, all right? When you guys get a chance and you have some of those things up, feel free to upload them. No pressure to upload anything though. So there's a couple of student examples that I'm gonna go through as you guys are working and finishing those things up, all right? So really what we're looking for here is any kind of recognition, right, of how it is that this might be occurring, right? So how do we take some amount of light and turn it into a number? Well, I have some student examples that some of my students have come up with, right? So it's this idea that if you have your STEM starter kit, right? So I have mine here, right? Some amount of data is being collected, right? And they show that through the light sensor, which they are saying that is powered by some kind of battery, right? And let me zoom in real quick on here as well, just so you guys have it, right, is being represented by some amount some way, right? And then that sensor measures some kind of intensity, right? And then based on that intensity, it's then calculating it, right, so that it is consistent with some kind of numerical value. So the students here have stated that there's some kind of mathematical process going in right, the light impacts the amount of current and or voltage, right, so students haven't decided yet which one of the two there are, right, but then the sensor compares that value to a set of predetermined values, right, and then measures those changes, right, and then based on those changes that it's measuring across those predetermined values, right, what the display is then showing is what that predetermined value might be. So one of the conversations that you can have with students at this point is, okay, so if that's the case, how does it measure things that are in between those values, right? Is it measuring those things in between? So if we go ahead and continue on and take another look at another student example, right? So here's a group that's kind of looking at this idea of how is it that this amount of light, which this group is stating is some kind of, some amount of energy is then being converted into some kind of electrical potential energy. Right, so the sensor measures something and then it's able to calculate the UV index and then show that as an output. But one of the things that students get hung up on, right, and this is really where a student difficulty might lie, is specifically how it's able to go through that measurement or calculation phase, 
right? And that's kind of where the heart of today's lesson kind of is. So there's a couple of questions in particular that I asked us to look at before we go through the group slides, right? So the first is using the actual slides below, right? In the first three portions about your roadmap, which we just talked about, how is it that you're able to communicate what's happening? And then secondly, right, is specifically stating what is happening for a value such as the temperature or the amount of light to correlate with the number that shows up on the OLED screen, right? So when you're in any environment, right, and you say that it's cold, right, or that it's hot or that it's neither, right, it's a lukewarm temperature, it's comfortable, right? What does that mean and how does that correlate to a numerical value, right? So when you make that correlation to the numerical value, then something must be happening inside the sensor or inside the processor, which is the brain with the robot on it, right, to make that kind of conversion. So does your roadmap, right, specifically for the students that are joining us today, does your roadmap include a model by any chance for how information is able to then move from one place to another, right? So the sensor is able to take the light in the environment, right, and then be able to collect it. But then how does that information that has been collected then move to the processor and then move to the display so that it can actually show that information? Is there a way that that is actually happening, right? And that's kind of one of the things that I want you guys to take a look at today. So I'm going to go ahead and exit my full screen momentarily to go back to the Google Doc. So I'm going to kind of move this, move through this process a little bit quicker now, right? So for students that have some responses, right, feel free to throw them into the slides. And then as I see kind of some things pop up, I'll go ahead and, and come back to it. But you'll see in this picture that there are two images attached, right? So I've taken the traditional STEM starter kit. And the two things that I've removed is the blue chip that says blue shift aerospace. And I've also removed the weather sensor. So that's the one with the cloud. The only chips that I have currently are the one that show the USB, the OLED display or the monitor, the processor, which is the robot icon, or the light sensor, which is the light bulb, right? So I have it in a configuration that looks like this. So students who are joining us can have it in whatever configuration that they would like. Teachers who are joining us, um, I would suggest that if you are working with younger students that you give them a framework for how to connect the, the sensors in particular mainly because you want to bridge the idea that light enters into the sun or light enters into the sensor, right? It moves through the processor, something happens here and then gets displayed on the actual OLED screen, right? Students, after they build this fundamental idea, right, then can go through the process of thinking about, okay, does the order actually matter? And then you can have students try rearranging these sensors and see if they still get valid measurements as a result. Right. So for our high school students, hopefully we have played around with the STEM starter kit. Right. The order itself doesn't necessarily matter. Right. What's most important is the order of the information flow. Right. So this middle processor chip, right, the robot, right, that's what's determining how that information is going from one place to the next. Right. So I have it in this configuration. And if you go ahead and take a look at today's information, right, you'll see that in the, I believe it's the actual, was it posted in the Discord? Let's see. Uh, I'm not sure if it actually was. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and post today's script into the chat room. So if you go ahead and take a look at the chat, you'll see today's uh, Arduino script uploaded there. For students who are joining us, if you do not have Arduino uploaded yet, or if you don't have Arduino installed, go ahead and take a minute, couple minutes right now to install that on a device. For those of you who are joining us and do not have a laptop or, or MacBook or, or an Apple product, if you're using an iPad or a Chromebook, there are ways to be able to interface through the web editor. If you're in that kind of situation, then feel free to um, post a question into the Discord, and then we'll be able to get you set up into how you can actually interface that way. All right. So I'm going to try something a little bit different, which might be a little bit difficult, right? I'm going to try to get us to follow along as I'm kind of moving through here. So the Arduino script is available through the GitHub, all right? And that information is posted there, and you should be able to kind of see the Arduino file here. So if you just go ahead and actually copy and paste the entire script, and just paste it into Arduino IDE, 
right, then you should see it pop up. So I'll go ahead and show you what it looks like on my side. The instructions for installing Arduino, that's a great question, James. That is available specifically through the GitHub as well as the actual Google Doc. So if you look up here at the front, right, it specifically states before A to start by opening up the Arduino program, and then you can download all these things. These links all go directly back to the GitHub as well. So you have access to them after the meeting today. So don't feel like you have to copy and paste all of these links down. They're all available through today's Google Doc. All right. Now, once you have that in particular, right, on your Arduino script or on my Arduino script, rather, it looks something like this. Let me just go ahead and share it so that we all are on the same page. Let me share my screen. So mine looks something like this, if I copy and paste it. So up at the top, there's some information about where emails can be sent if you have questions, right? And there's some description about the libraries in particular. So if your students are unfamiliar with Arduino or your students haven't yet kind of gone through the process of understanding how Arduino works yet, then it's totally fine for them to look at this in the context of a black box. So teachers ahead of time, what you can do is you can take one of your STEM starter kits, leave it as is, and then you can take your other STEM starter kit and make one of these and then upload the Arduino circuit to it, all right? When you upload the Arduino, or I'm sorry, the Arduino script to it, right? What this circuit will show is specifically just the light reading as Lux as well as UV index onto the OLED display, all right? So what this script is doing is it's simply just telling us how it is that the sensor is going to then show this value, right? So the question for us still remains as to what value it is actually showing, All right? So if we go back to the Google Doc here, one of the things that I've included is this idea of kind of a did you know, right? So think of it as a stop gap, right? So for our students joining us, right? This is where we can kind of think about what it is that the processor is doing in between the light sensor itself and the OLED display. For our teachers, this would be a good chance for you to be able to bring the class back together, right? And kind of have a whiteboard sharing session about how it is that certain circuits that you designed, right? In your small groups, then students can get an idea as a large group. And that's essentially what this whiteboard sharing session does as well, right? So this is a way for students to kind of come together, upload their road, road maps. So we have another roadmap here from one of our groups. This looks great, fantastic, right? So we see that we have a similar idea and pathway as some of the example students provided. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and full screen this just so that we can get a better look at it, right? So here, student is saying the overall device itself, right? It's connected both internally and externally, right? So if we think about the external connections, right? That's the physical setup. And then the internal is all of those pathways connected by the actual connectors right, of the sensor chips themselves, right? So these connectors seem to, for this group, be taking light, turning it into some value of lux or UV index, right, which could be potentially a number. And then the weather sensor also takes this temperature, right, makes the measurement, has a numerical calculation. And then we also have non-contact sensors within the temperature sensor, right, through this light entry, right? So all of this information, right, as well as the soil, soil moisture sensor, right, which is included, right, all that information somehow needs to be processed, right? So this group here, right, has the information that the sensors are gathering, but not necessarily how all that information then is actually shown on the OLED display, right? So that's kind of the next big part that I want to talk about, right? How is it that all of this information kind of comes together? This group here, we have the light, right? Then light goes through a resistor to give some kind of voltage. So it seems that this group has made the decision that it's measuring a potential difference versus a current right, limited based off of what Arduino is capable of processing, right, so now this, this group or this student in particular is able to understand this idea of what it is that the processor is doing, right, so the sensor then turns it into some other kind of value going from voltage now to some kind of numerical number, right, and then the computer chip then turns this value across some kind of data set, right, using that universal standard. Right, so comparing this data across some known value, right, to then output some kind of value. So I'm gonna go ahead and exit full screen again real quick. And this is a great time for us to now be able to move on actually. Right, 
So in this, did you know, one of the things that I state is that processors themselves are actually complex circuits, right? So simple circuits, if you are in high school, right, you know, might consist of maybe some kind of power source, some wires, right, and then some kind of resistor. So for elementary school students or K to eight students, right, one of the things that you could do as a predecessor lesson to this is a simple circuit with a switch. So what processors are then, right, is basically a complex series of all of these switches, right? And if the switch can turn a light bulb on or off, right, then students can understand this idea that the light bulb when on can represent something and the light bulb when off can represent something. Right. So what students can build here is a natural translation from an analog signal into a digital kind of signal. So for my students that are joining us today, if you guys now go through and look at questions D and E, right, essentially we're now addressing that kind of middle point question, right? So you guys did a great job working through those slides to kind of come up with that question in particular, which now leads us to the next activity, right, or the next part of this lab right now. So from parts D to G, right, think back to your group's method, right? Was your group's method in particular able to actually describe how much light is being seen by the sensor itself, right? If you weren't able to come up with a method of being able to articulate how much light there would be besides just light on and light off, then one of the things that I would suggest that you guys think about now is coming up with a model that might be able to do that. And in particular, right, where that model changes might be either at the sensor or it might be at the processor, all right? How is it then that you might be able to fine tune the amount of light, right? Rather than saying, okay, so there's this much light or this much light, how could we say exactly how much light there is? Believe it or not, the human eye, right, is also a very, very sensitive type of sensor, right? We're constantly seeing light, right? And we can see small changes in light, right? Can your sensor do the same thing? If so, how is it doing that in particular, right? And then how much of that light is it that the, the processor or the robot chip, right, can actually understand and then show on the OLED screen itself? So think about how often that actual value is changing. So for those of you guys that were able to successfully get the light sensor kind of set up, right, you should be able to see that the light value is constantly changing, even though for our eyes, right, the value itself might not necessarily be changing. And then lastly, in this activity, right, for your group slides, how is it that your group's translations of that data took it into account, right? So how is it that your translations that your group is stating actually takes into account this fine tuning capability, right? Where is it that this translation might actually happen in the roadmap? So if your group is saying that this translation is happening at the sensor, make sure you think about why it might be happening at the sensor. If you're saying that it happens at the processor, why is it that it happens there though? All right, so I'll give you guys about five minutes to kind of work through that, all right? And then while students are doing that, for the teachers in particular, if we go back to the Google Doc, right, one of the things that I kind of want to bring your attention to is this idea that students are building their understanding of how they can create a model to go from this idea of potentially analog signals to a digital one, right? So notice when addressing the students, right? Assuming that all of our students right now are kind of working through their roadmap, right? When addressing the students, I didn't necessarily utilize the word analog or the word digital, right? Nor did I try to actually describe them in terms of a definition for the students yet. The idea and the goal here is that students are building a need for that definition because the use of analog by itself isn't enough to tell us then how it is that the processor or the sensor is actually communicating to then show a numerical value, right? So if it's not analog, then there must be another way that is correlating with that analog signal, right? So the example that I brought up is the human eye. Right. So the eye is an example of an analog sensor. Right. In our case, right, analog sensors are very, very sensitive. Another example that you can actually bring up is if you if you have experience with music, right, is the big debate between, you know, acoustic type of music being produced versus digital kinds of music being produced. Right. Why is it that a why is it that some people might say that a vinyl record sounds better? Right. Or some people might say that in a vinyl record, you can hear the room. Whereas on a CD player, right, or something that is a, an MP3 of a digital transmission, you might say that those qualities are lost, 
right? So what is it that we mean when those qualities are lost? So again, this idea that we're taking an analog signal, right? And somehow changing it into something else, all right? So as students are continuing to work through, one of the things that I would suggest that teachers think about for this section, for the segment of D to G is specifically what your own personal example might be and how you might be able to create a lesson or a lesson or two before or after, right? That might stitch together this in context for your students as well, right? And then same thing for our nine to 12 um, age group as well, right? So what is a predecessor lesson might be something about waves. It could be, it could be electromagnetic or it could be something that is uh, mechanical, right? And then afterwards kind of follow up and talk about, okay, so now that we have this digital transmission, you know, how can we think about the communication of that digital information or the storage of that digital information, right? And you can see how we're slowly kind of manipulating our way into kind of this next bulk, which we're going to be talking about next week, which is now the actual communication protocols of that information once we take an analog signal and turn it into a digital one, all right? So for my students who are working through, I'll give you guys about another minute here, and then we'll see kind of if anything is coming through. So nothing on the slides yet, and that's totally okay, all right? So as you guys are working here, I don't wanna take up too much time just because I do unfortunately have a hard cutoff at 10.15, um, and I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Um, one of the things that you guys should have been able to see is that using analog by itself, right, is not going to be enough either for the, for the sensors, right, or for the processor. So you can have this analog signal then that is translated by your sensor itself into across some table and give you some kind of values for lux. But then one of the things that becomes an issue is how it is that that information then is actually communicated. And then it turns out that there are limits, right? So if your group said, oh, the sensor is taking some kind of current or voltage then and directly putting it across a table and then measuring based on that table what the value should be in terms of lux for temperature, then one of the things that I would ask you to think about is whether or not, right, that table, right, or that index of tables then can actually contain an infinite number of currents, right? So I want you to think about this concept of infinity for a second. Theoretically speaking, right, infinity makes a lot of sense to us, right? So when your eyes see the color blue, right, technically your eye is seeing an infinite array of blue, right? It's just when we describe it, right, we kind of collapse it down into one color, right? And we say, yes, the sky today is blue. Or if it's gray, if it's rainy outside we, or cloudy, we can say, oh, the sky today is gray, right? but your eye is seeing more than just one color, right? It's seeing many, many, many different colors. So it turns out then that if your sensor were to collect all of those colors or all of that information about how much light there is, right? Then that would technically be an infinite number of currents and an infinite number of voltages, right? So if it's infinite, then how is it possible that it actually exists in real life? right? So there must be some kind of limitation there, right? And that limitation then is that it needs to be translated into some other way of communicating what that value is. So the same way that we see the sky, right? And then we communicate that it is a color, it's blue or it is gray, right? We take all that information and kind of collapse it down, right? So your sensors, right? Either the sensor itself, if you said the sensor does it or the processor, right? Is able to do exactly that except it can do it in a little bit more sophistication than we might say in terms of just the color blue, right? If I were to ask Judy what the color of the sky outside is today, she might say instead of blue, she might say, oh, it's an aqua blue, right? And she can put some kind of modifier in front and it's a little bit more specific, right? Or she can say that it is a blue jay blue, right? And in that same way, right, your sensors and processors are doing exactly that. Right, so this set amount of current and voltage then, it correlates with a set number or a set amount of light that can be seen. So it turns out that if we go down to this next, did you know, right? This idea of a voltage or potential difference, right? Is what we then call an analog value, right? Because that value, right? It doesn't necessarily end, right? It's technically this infinite amount, right? The same way that I discussed with our eye, 
right? But then that analog value, it turns out directly has a correlation as what we refer to in terms of a digital value, right? A digital measurement is one that makes an approximation for what the real world value itself might actually represent. We can use right this idea of a simple circuit turning on and off, right? That a series of ons and offs, right? So instead of a light bulb being on and off, what if we say that the light bulb on is A and the light bulb off is B, right? Then a series of A's and B's can mean a particular thing, right? So if you have a table where three A's in a row mean there is a hundred lux, right? Or A A and B mean a hundred and ten lux. Right, then you can differentiate those amounts of actual light. So now what we can do is we can take some amount of current or some amount of voltage and be able to translate it into this idea of some kind of digital means in particular. So if we go back to actually our slides, right, I ask this one question. right. So here I show you now an analog signal and a digital signal. Right, so this idea of A or B versus this analog signal where we can say that there's a large wide array of things that are happening. One of the questions that I have for you guys is in groups, right, if you are working in groups, right, is ask this question of what might be some key differences between an analog signal and a digital one, and what is that information that it communicates to you? Right. So for our students, I'll give you guys about a minute or two to kind of think through what those things might be. And for our teachers, while students are thinking, the big thing that I would say to focus on here is kind of notice what the graphical differences might be. Right. So on an analog signal, right, students might say that it can be both positive as well as negative. Right. And I recognize that as students are listening, right, I'm saying these things, but that's OK. Right. And then on our digital graph, right, we see that it doesn't actually go into the negatives at all. Right. So does that potentially mean something? Right. And how do we then translate this idea of an analog signal into a digital one that way? Right. So students here are able to build this idea that there potentially is going to be some kind of loss in information. Right. If we move further into that, right, then students can also see that there is this idea that an analog signal, right, based on the graph is curved. Whereas a digital signal is not, right? It's much more, it's much more 90 degree in all of its angles versus kind of this smooth, continuous kind of flow. So for students who are in, in high school, right, they can explain, oh, we can manipulate that digital signal so that it can mimic the analog signal, right? But it will never be exactly all of the information that the analog signal has, right? So for our students who are with us, right, I gave you a little bit of time to kind of think through the graph, right? You've heard some of the things that I shared with the teachers as being some of the common things that you might find, right? I would say if you found anything that is different than the two things that I included, feel free to throw them into the chat, right? And I'll be able to discuss them for you guys as well, right? But really the idea here, right, for us as a whole is that we want to be able to show that the general pattern that an analog signal has can be shown using a digital one as well. One of the things that I didn't talk about though is this idea of what if the negative part of our analog signal is important, right? What if it's not just telling us, yes, this is present or no, it's not present. What if it's more important than that and it actually gives us information that is useful to us? Well, in that case, one of the things that we could potentially do is we could take that digital signal, right? And what if we had zero and instead of five, right, we had a different voltage, right? Maybe zero and three represent this idea of what's happening on our negative um, axis, on our negative y axis of our analog signal, right, to be that negative portion, right? So that when you have three volts, really it's representing this idea of the zero to negative five volt. Right. And then when you have zero to five volt, you have that traditional zero to five volt analog signal. Right. So there's ways that we can still be able to compensate for the losses that we have in an analog signal. Right. But still, even if we do that, it's still not perfect. Right. So there's always going to be some amount of information loss. But the idea here is then how much is an appropriate amount of that loss? Right. So is there an amount that we can kind of come to a consensus? Yes, we are getting a good enough reading, right, that the information coming to us is valuable. Or is it that we need more information, right, and we need more data to be collected simultaneously, right? And that is what tells us what the limitations of our sensors themselves are. 
So if you guys take a look at your light sensor, right, as well as your weather sensor that you have on your actual STEM SDG kit, right, the ones that you guys have initially, right, there is a range at which those things can actually make measurements, right? So if there's way, 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 way too much light, right, then your sensor will max out at a certain value, right? Or if it's so, 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 so dark, right, but there's only a little bit of light, right, then your sensor might be able to show that there's, it's as if there's no light because it's not sensitive enough to those lower extremes, right? So the more extreme you go, either with the light sensor, no light or lots of, or way too much light with the weather sensor, right, being then way, way, way too cold or way, 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 way too hot, right? Then in the same way, there's those limitations at the extremes, right? So that's really where we, where we see the most of that loss between an analog and digital signal in particular. So if we come back actually to the, um, to the Google Doc in particular, now I ask these questions between H, I, and J, right? And here, now I'm asking you to kind of zoom out a little bit, right, from the kits we utilize today and think more holistically. What you guys have in your hands, right, and Judy and Bjarka say all the time, right, these are satellites that actually go into space. Believe it or not, what you guys have in your hands, these are the same exact things that many people at NASA use as well, right? So here in the US, right, it's NASA, right, for the continent of Africa, right? Each country might have its own particular NASA type brand, right? In Europe, right, they have one joint uh, space agency of ESS. Uh, or ESA. So all of these groups, right, believe it or not, right, they fundamentally start the same exact way that you guys are starting. So how is it that the satellites you guys have and you guys are building, how is it that it's going to then potentially be recording that data now that it actually collects, right? It's one thing to just display the data, right, on the OLED screens here on Earth, but unfortunately, right, we are not going with the satellites to space, right? So we can't necessarily look at the OLED screen while the satellites are up there. So that information somehow has to come down to us as well, right? So based on your understanding then that you've kind of created so far in, that, in the first two portions of this lab activity, do you think then it might be easier to record that data in terms of absolute voltages and potential differences? Or would it be easier then for us to kind of correlate those potential differences represented as some other value as a combination of numbers or numbers, right? That might be able to easier communicate, right? Down to earth, right? If we have some kind of um, wireless connection or some kind of connection specifically to a storage mode, such as an SD card, right? You guys use them all the time, right? On your phones, right? There's some way that it can store the pictures that you take, right? So if you ever, you know, record a large video, right? You know that it takes lots of space, right? So why is it that it takes up so much space, right? How is it that that information is actually existing on those devices? The next question that I ask in this chunk is what if you then also had the really difficult task of both simultaneously having to collect that data to show it on an OLED screen, but also be able to record it to save it for later on, right? So what if you're doing not just one thing, but what if you're telling your processor to do those two things at the same time, then how is it that that works, right? So there must be some kind of way that we can actually go through then separating the communication of the data that's going to be shown on the OLED screen, as well as the data that's going to be stored on an SD card, right? Or downlinked through some kind of wireless connection such as LoRa or Bluetooth or even Wi-Fi, right? And that actually gives us a sneak peek into what we are going to talk about next week, right? So once we've kind of as assumed and come to the conclusion that yes, we have this digital data now, right? Then how do we tell where that digital data or how do we tell that digital data where to go, right? And that's actually going to be the beginning portions of next week. And we'll talk a little bit further about the different kinds of transmission protocols that we have, right? That these sensors are utilizing to be able to complete those tasks in particular, all right? The last thing that I have in this section is if you were able to successfully upload the, uh, the today's lab script onto your STEM starter kits, Right. One of the things that you can do is go ahead and click on the link below that I do not yet have up. I'll make sure I add it in here, right? And I'll put it into the chat.
but there is a flash file that you can now put the processor back into its original state for how it came to you, all right? So for that, instead of using Arduino, there's a separate set of steps that you can follow. They are all super self-explanatory. If you and your students have any trouble with that process, feel free to go into the Discord and drop the questions that you guys have in there. And then either myself, Cody, or Viarco and, and Judy will be able to address them directly, all right? So that kind of concludes this portion um, for our students. On our teacher side, I also have a reflection part that's built into the lab, all right? So this is where you get to kind of see how students are thinking more metacognitively about the activities that they just did. So if you choose to break this up into multiple lessons, right, then one of the things that you can do is you can have them reflect at each specific portion, right? So kind of the way, same way that we came together as a large group, right, and had the groups kind of share out their whiteboards, right? You can have your, your classroom and your small groups in your classrooms do the same exact thing. So the three questions there are looking at things metacognitively as a whole. Um, Judy has gone ahead and posted kind of what next week's session is about. So the students already have a little bit of a head start in thinking about this idea now of taking that digital information and translating it to send it somewhere. So next week, what we will be doing is actually looking at the engineering portion of communication and for these satellites and the hardware, thinking about how data actually travels and communicates along the pathway of these kind of circuits that they've designed, right? And how is it that you can also simultaneously do a job, right? And we'll be looking at protocols of I squared C as well as SPI in particular, all right? So it's 10, 11 right now. I wanted to make sure we had about five minutes left for questions and general troubleshooting. Again, like I said, all of this information that um, I, uh, shown today through my shared screen will be available to everyone in this session right now. Um, Cody has gone ahead and sent out a link to you guys so you have that information and we have the recording going as well. But if you have questions or your students have questions as you are going along the way, feel free to drop those things into the Discord and then we can address them directly there. All right. So again, kind of the, a plug for the Discord channel in general, that's really going to be our main hub for responding to any type of uh, technical issues you guys are having or any type of troubleshooting issues. For teachers, um, all, everyone K to 12, if you actually go ahead and jump into the teacher space, that's a great way to get a hold of me directly. I try to check that, check that room in particular every day um, and multiple times a day as well. So if you have particular questions for me, go, going straight to there is always a great way to get your questions answered um, completely and holistically. If you have a particular question um, that might only pertain to you, then feel free to email me directly. And my email is listed out in the actual Arduino script from today as well. All right. So I'll go ahead and make sure that I have the link below for getting everything back onto your original SDG kit um, that it came originally flashed with. That's about it for me, Judy. Thank you so much for joining us, especially for our students. Thank you for taking time out and, and being a part of this. Wonderful. Daniel, thank you very, very much. Um, we know you, you need to go right now, but I, I'm going to be here. Cody is here um, and we can certainly field uh, a number of questions and comments uh, for the next 17 minutes. Great. Uh, Cody, I'm going to make you a co-host uh, if that's okay with you. Great. Daniel, fascinating. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm also looking forward to the engineering session next week. Uh, so, so that's going to be great. And um, what I've done is that I've, I've put in the link uh, to the page that we're building that if you actually want to put back the original code that your kit arrived with, then you'll certainly be able to do that. Um, so, so, yeah. Great. Uh, Matthew is asking, where, where can we find the recordings of the meeting? Okay. Um, uh, Matthew, what we have is we're building, we're building this particular page. Let me just quickly find it. Um, uh, let, let me just find it quickly and send you the link. Um, if you've received, Matthew, if you've received a, um, a kit that has a blue shift aerospace uh, chip in it. On the back, there's a QR code. You scan that QR code and it'll take you to this particular page. 
Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the link as well in the chat. Okay, so let's just go here. So this is the page, here we go. Um, Blue Shift Max IQ Kit. So this page has all of the recordings. Um, it has all of the links to all of the content that you're gonna require uh, and all of that. Um, so, so yeah, please, uh, please just have a look at that. Um, and uh, great, um, Matthew, thank you very much. Are there any other questions uh, for me that I can assist everybody with? Uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, uh, Daniel, I, I know I'm surprised you haven't left yet. <laughs> so cheers, we don't want you to be late. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, just what... finishing up a couple of things on the on the dock for resetting, that's all. Okay, okay, that's absolutely great. I'm gonna share the slide again um, so that we can actually then contextualize, there we go. We can contextualize where we are going, right? Um, uh, I see we have a raised hand, yes, yes, please. Uh, the, the champion team. From from Senegal, please uh, go ahead. Hello. Hi, so my name is uh, Raki. I'm from Senegal. I'm in the American Bilingual School. And I have a question. So um, we received the kit, but it's not a complete kit. So I wanted to ask uh, for the roadmap, are we supposed to wait until we receive the, the other kit to do the roadmap and then send it to you? Or are we supposed to do it with what we actually have um, right now and then maybe do another one once we receive it or like what, what are we supposed to do? Okay, great. Um, so so what it is is that we are, I, I know that you have a CubeSat kit. I know that you have an X in a box CubeSat kit. Okay. Um, what you will be receiving over the next, probably over the next week is gonna be the starter kit. Um, let me just get mine, hang on a second. Okay, so what this is, this is a this is the next version. So this is version 1.5. So your kit, of course, is always going to work. Your your X in a box kit that you have is always going to work. Um, but what you'll be receiving is you'll be receiving this starter kit. Um, and then what happened, you can see it's very, very similar. It's got the same footprint. Uh, as the X in a box chips, that the screen is identical, etc. Um, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be starting with this kit, and then we're going to be adding on uh, additional components for flight hardware. So we're going to be adding on an accelerometer. Um, if you are doing a project where you really would like to have the gas sensor, you can add the gas sensor. We have a barometer which will give you atmospheric pressure, very accurate atmospheric pressure. Are we adding that, et cetera? Um, also, the thing is that I'm not sure if you can see, but this, this particular core, um, I'm just, let me just pin myself as well so that um, we can see it on the video. You'll see here, uh, this has got uh, uh, touch pads. Okay, now you're not gonna wanna fly it with touch pads. So what we're doing is that we're making your flight hardware with exactly the same core, exactly the same called the ESP32, um, but just in a version that doesn't have touch pads and it's got an SD card added to it, et cetera. So, um, so we're gonna start using this ESP32 on this kit right now to start building our code and doing all of our experiments, et cetera. Um, but yeah, your hardware is gonna come, you're gonna get a number of shipments with, with your add-on pieces for your hardware. Okay, so I hope that that, that um, uh, explains that, if that's okay. Thank you, thank you. Absolute pleasure, wonderful, wonderful to, to meet you all. Um, great, we have some questions here. Uh, Daniel Lee mentioned something about us working in teams for the roadmap, um, how do we go about doing that? Um, uh, Kareen, uh, what we're doing is, Karine, I think your team leader is Nico. Um, I know that your group was only formed earlier this week. So uh, what we'll be doing is with Nico, we'll be getting together to, to work out how exactly we work in a group. Um, but yeah, what it is is that we have 
We have over 40 groups around the world participating in this uh, suborbital launch. Um, and, uh, and often what we have is we either have a teacher at these sessions or otherwise we have a team leader at these sessions, etc. cetera. Um, I can see that I still have a raised hand from Senegal. Is that correct? Or should I take your hand down? I'm gonna lower your hand, so that's cool. Um, good, uh, Cody is sending a, a message saying, please follow uh, Lab Zero. Uh, he sent out the link earlier. He sent it, he's put it both in the, uh, in the chat of the session. He's also put it in the Discord, uh, on the Discord server. So, um, Great. And yes, thanks, Daniel. That was wonderful. Tora, Tora, please. Uh, yes, please. Welcome. If Hi. you'd like to turn on your... Hi, nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you, Judy. And nice to meet everyone else on the teams. Um, so I am the faculty advisor for the Jamaica team from Northern Caribbean University. And we haven't received our kit as yet, but we're, I'm just really trying to keep up and really try to understand what all we're working with. Um, right. And so I had a few questions. So the kit right. that we'll be getting, yes. the, the components you had put together there, that is basically the satellite. Because I uh, would... no. No, no, okay. This, this is because... this is only the start of the satellite. Okay, because I was okay. like, so these are just the sensors then. And then we're going to connect this to the satellite, connect it onto the satellite. Yeah. What you're gonna do okay. is so eventually. Yeah, what you're going to do is you're going to start with this kit. Um, you're uh -huh. going to start with this kit so that you can start coding your your core, your ESP32. You're also going to you're certainly going to be able to use your light sensor, and you are going to be able to use your weather sensor. Um, right. You're not going to be flying your USB, so you're going to have an additional power solution. You're not going to be flying the screen um, because mm. it's not going to handle the flight, so you're not going to be flying that. So what we're going to what we're going to what we're going to be doing is we're going to be adding to your kit um, so that you also you have you have different options. Okay. Um, so so we won't use, and we won't be sorry, but and we won't be using that um, was that top right with the buttons because I heard you say we're not going to. Yeah, that's not going to fly yeah. either. The, okay. This particular board isn't going to fly, but it's using exactly the same processor. So you're going to be okay. able to start coding and developing your code using this processor because it's identical to the one you are going to receive in your flight hardware okay so we can basically code once we get the kit we can basically upload whatever code um like the yeah. one um daniel had just sent we can upload yeah. that to the system and then yeah. okay and then we can replace those pieces with the with the other parts that are going to fly on the system are going to fly absolutely. okay absolutely um, yeah all right so i'm just trying to wrap my head around it all um some of the students for us are not necessarily engineers so um so that's why i'm kind of here taking in some of the k-12 stuff because some of it might be useful for those that don't have that engineering background um, to kind of help them to catch up to the engineers um, who are in the group. Hmm. Um, yeah, so I think that was, those were my questions for right. today. I meet you guys again. Uh, absolutely, uh, Tora, the thing is that certainly not everybody's an engineer. Uh, I myself, uh, I'm a first a chemist. Um, so I'm not an aerospace or an electronics engineer. Um, so, and the thing is, we do have a number of students who bring with them the different disciplines. So it is a, it's a STEM program. And so that is why we're focusing on the science aspects, on the engineering aspects, et cetera, et cetera. So we can bring everybody up to speed. We don't all have to start off being experts in order to participate. We just have to start off by being interested. Yeah, so I that is so. the approach we're taking. Yeah, so we're looking forward to getting our kids oh, soon. Absolutely. And then I think it'll make more sense for the students. Um, so 
I'll see you guys back at three o'clock, I guess. <laughs> yes, wonderful. Okay, great. Tora, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, did anybody else having a, having a question for us? Okay, so let me go to, uh, I'm quickly going to go to um, that slide again, just to contextualize everything. Good. Okay, so um, we didn't have this up for long earlier. So this is today's session. We were looking at communication. How do we, how do we manage the communication between our senses? and our outputs, so our inputs and our outputs. So with every single instrument that we're going to build, we always need four elements. Input, output, processor, and power. Um, and uh, so the thing is that our processor is given. We're always going to be using the same processor. Um, and then we, our input is from our sensors. And then our output, in, this case, in the case that Daniel was referring to today, was the screen this little OLED screen? Um, we also next week we're going to have a look at what do we how do we manage output so that we can see it on the Kibana dashboard? And here there he's going to be talking about Internet of Things and how do we communicate in terms of Internet of Things? So that's in, going to be the engineering piece. And then we're going to have a specialist, a professional, who is actually going to chat with us about how is this applied in industry? How is this applied in the aerospace industry? How does this actually, um, how is this going to lead into a career that you could find really, really interesting? Um, and we're going to do the same with two payload iterations. Um, and uh, in each case, we're going to be looking at the science of the payload that we're going to use, or we're going to select um, the engineering aspects and also a professional and career webinar. And then finally, operations in terms of um, how do we actually put it all together in terms of our code, um, how how are we actually gonna how are we gonna develop this huge piece of code um, that we're gonna have for our for our mission. And just to say, if you find that you're struggling and your code isn't working and you're not gonna make it by the deadline, don't worry, okay, um, because. What Bjork has been doing, Bjork is the inventor of, of these chips. What he's been doing is as he's been developing each of the sensor boards, each of every, every, every single one of the boards, he has been developing the software because he uses it to test everything. So he's going to have a full set of, of software for you um, that can uh, interact with every single one of the sensors. You're also going to be able to develop your own sensors, which you can then add to that code. Um, so, yeah, I can see that we have a few questions. So let me actually just stop sharing. Um, great. Uh, Emmanuel, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you, yeah, the YouTube channel. Um, Emmanuel, thank you very much. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm moving. I move, I'm replicating a, a, a number of the relevant videos from my channel to the Max IQ uh, channel. Um, so thank you very much for that plug. Um, and uh, uh, Reza, thank you very much. Um, uh, and I know we, we are we're probably going to, to go over the time, but um, yeah, Reza uh, was so, uh, one of the participants on our United Nations development program last year relating to the sustainable development goals. Um, and both, actually both Emmanuel and Reza are really good when it comes to um, troubleshooting. So if you have any challenges with your kits, wow, on the Discord channel, just reach out and just pose the question. Uh, you're always gonna get some assistance. So um, what I'd like to do is if there's uh, if there are any more questions, let's just handle them quickly because we have a minute still to go. Okay, good. Um, Reza, yes, uh, you we've uh, sent the link to the Discord out. Um, uh, Cody's going to post it here in the chat as well. And uh, yeah, you should have received the link by email. But if you haven't, um, 
Cody's going to be able to put it in the chat for us. Good. Uh, Declan, thank you very much. Uh, good. Uh, Megan, I can see you have your hand raised. Please go ahead. Hi, Judy. Hi, everyone. Um, I just had a question regarding the kit. So I currently have the Sustainable Development Goals Kit, and I see you're holding a blue shift kit. Is that a, is there maybe a difference between the kit that I have and the kit that you have? Um, if you could just answer that, thank you. No, you don't. In your kit, you have an Intel SAT chip. This and and in this case, we have a blue shift chip. Um, some people have Max IQ chips. Uh, some people have Virgin Orbit chips. Um, so what it is, is that this is what we call a mechanical uh, blank chip. So it doesn't have a sensor or a processor or anything on it. However, what it does do is it still has the copper lanes for the I squared C communication as well as for power. Um, and what we do is we, we, re we use it in a way just only simply for branding, but also there's a QR code in the back that takes you to the page. Uh, Megan, if you just look back in the chat, you'll see that there was a link to a page that we're building um, that says Blue Shift Max IQ Kit. Okay, I, I'll also send that out in, in a, a link. So no, please don't worry. Everything else is actually the same. And everything else is interchangeable. So, so don't worry about that. Um, one of the reasons why we have these chips is I've got it in this format now where, uh, because I, I, often I don't use my soil moisture sensor, but I, I want to have it, uh, I want to have six chips together so that I can have the redundancy. So that if something happens to one of these connectors, the communication and the power can go the other way, you know, because otherwise I may have it like this. You know, if I were to take that that board away, then I would have a gap. I would have a gap, which means that my processor is standing alone. It can only so I have a vulnerability here in terms of that connector. Uh, if something happens to that connector, my 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 kit breaks. And and this is something we really need to consider when we're going to fly anything in space. Um, is because we're going to be exposed to a lot of vibrations, a lot of uh, jerking and jolting. Um, and so we need to make sure that our kit is uh, as stable as possible. Now, you'll notice that there's a very, very strong reason why we actually use these connectors and why we have these small boards. What we could have done is we could have actually had this ball and board in one PCB and we could have flown that. But the problem is that they can get brittle and the copper lanes can snap or the soldering can come apart. You'll see here, these, these it can actually flex a little bit. You see, it can actually flex. And so it's really great. So what happens is when we have our launch and we're experiencing that five Gs of acceleration and the vibration from that rocket, um, our payload's going to survive because of these connectors. Um, and that's actually why the X chips have been so successful on all types of launches and missions is because actually of these little connectors. Um, so Megan, I hope that explains uh, that for you. Uh, great. Um, Kareen, uh, Judy, I just wanted to ask whether everything we will be learning for the next few weeks will be part of the suborbital challenge. Um, yeah, certainly in these Wednesday sessions, um, yeah, you're going to be learning a lot uh, going towards the, the suborbital challenge. Uh, Kareen, that's, that's absolutely correct. Um, and then Tora was, uh, okay, one last question. The Arduino code sent today for the light sensor. Um, yeah, uh, uh, we, can we directly upload that to the processor? Uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely. You can upload your Arduino code. You can also code, you can code this ESP32 in uh, MicroPython, in Java and C, C++. So you can, uh, you've got a number of different coding options and then you can always put back the original code that it came with, uh, if you would like to. Um, great, I can see there's a hand up from Senegal. Please uh, go ahead. Hi, excuse us, this, we are in school right now and the bell just rings, so we need to speak. Sorry, I need you to speak up a little bit. I couldn't hear you. I said that, I'm so sorry, but we are in school right now and the bell just rings. 
So we need to go. go. You go. That's fine. We've gone over. Thank you. Thank See you next week. It was Thanks. great. It was great. I love the conversation. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks. Cheers. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Good. Um, okay, everybody. Um, what I need to do is actually close down the session. So thank you all very much for attending. Um, I hope you've been able to copy and paste the links. Um, and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to see you all next week.